Hey, my friends, this is John Henry Weston for LifeSite News, and we're going to bring you this breaking news because today uh, there is a religious community that has felt God calling them to reveal something very important. Uh, today is the release date that they suggested, and it's truly remarkable how we came upon this because it I was led by Providence to go to them for a completely different reason. Um, Father will explain that to you in a few minutes. But they, unbeknownst to anybody, because all they were was this amazing religious community that offered religious retreats to everybody. It's been there for some 20 years offering these retreats. Thousands of people have benefited from the Mission of Divine Mercy down in New Braunfels, Texas. People have gone there in the hundreds to experience uh, basically a revival of their faith. And it's been so beautiful and so meaningful to so many people. Well, this place has had, they didn't tell anybody before, they've had revelations from heaven for a long, long time. They kept those to themselves because they didn't feel called to reveal them publicly. Um, in fact, the bishop told them not to, but all of a sudden they feel called by our Lord to reveal them now. Those messages pertain to the situation in the church right now. And that's why it's so important. On the, on the note of reality, the Our Lady tells everybody the church is without a shepherd. Our Lord talks in the revelations about the infiltration in the church. It's time for us to wake up and see, but on the positive side of these messages, they say basically that the heavenly counterattack begins right now. You're going to want to stay tuned to this breaking news right now. We are here with breaking news from the Mission of Divine Mercy here in New Braunfels, Texas. Um, it is a mission that's been going on here for some 20 years now, uh, run by uh, and founded by uh, Father John Mary. Father John Mary, thanks for being with us. Yeah, John Henry, it seems to be very providential. When you contacted me two weeks ago, I was already thinking that for this news, the person we wanted to talk to you about it was you because of your faith and courage. But we never had any contact, you or I. And then out of the blue for something separate, you contacted me. So it's God's providence. Indeed. Indeed. So if you can tell us, Father, um, there's some revelations you said that have been received here that, in fact, have been going on many, many years. But you were called to basically keep them to yourself until now. Right. And so that's the, the news, the decision that we want to release now. The first of, I think, what will be many more messages, a message from the Lord that he's given for the world today. And uh, this has been going on for some time. We'll talk a little bit about that. But we didn't have permission to release them that we, we would have wanted to. But now we feel like the Lord, because of the urgency of the situation, the Lord is asking us to do so. Give us some indication of, of what the messages are about. What's so urgent about the message now? Give us a little, uh, like an encapsulation. So this message and the other messages are speaking, first of all, of the situation we're in. Because I think a lot of people, even a lot of Catholics, are not aware of what a crisis the church is in, how dangerous is the situation the church is in. And so the messages are first to waken people up to what's really going on in our world and especially in our church. But above all, there to give a great message of hope and consolation that the Lord is preparing for his great reconquest of souls. That he wants to, he wants to begin this great battle with the army that he's already been preparing throughout the world. And so that's what he's announcing. And he wants our little mission to be an important part of that announcing this battle, this great reconquest in which he will be giving his light to clarify like the grace of illumination of conscience and also pouring out graces to strengthen, because we know a lot of us are very discouraged right now, confused and discouraged. So he wants to, he wants to give us his light, to give us his strength. And above all, I think what he's telling us is he himself is going to act. You know, a lot of people have been saying that with the situation in the church today, there's no human solution. It has to be God who acts. And that's what he's saying. That he wants to act, and this, this is a, a little part of what he wants to do. Beautiful. I think that's going to be a super encouraging message for people, because... This is it. We've come to a point of confusion so grave that it is like the scripture said. In the end, even the elect, if it be possible, will be confused. We have confusion on a scale today like this never existed in the church before. Even when there was 
three popes or when there was the Borgia popes and you had all sorts of infidelity, there wasn't this type of confusion because then it was bad men doing bad things. And, you know, you had saints on either side of different popes. But even that wasn't as confusing because while that was a confusion over who is the pope, now it's a confusion of totally the faith. What is the faith anymore when it keeps changing from day to day? Uh, that the as apologists used to say, you know, show me one teaching of the church that changed in 2000 years and I will become a Protestant. No one has said that in the past 10 years. So uh, yeah, it's very, very severe. So in, in that sense, there's going to be a great excitement about, about this. We're going to play a little clip of your read of some part of that message uh, right now. So let's do that. Children, the battle looms and you are asleep. I come to awake you as a good mother who, being vigilant and keeping watch over her children and seeing the increasing danger, shakes her children so that they may not perish without fighting. Children, these are the times announced from of old in which the thrice-cursed serpent will poison many and meddle in what is ours and will rise to confuse the nations with his puppets, his servants, to destroy all that is of God and to take his place in sovereignty. His longing to be adored and his hatred for God have motivated him to prepare for centuries what is now being unveiled before your eyes. I have come to you, children, time and time again, year after year, to warn you, to call you to the battle, to give you weapons with which to fight and defeat Satan's works. But how few of you have listened to me. How few of you have understood me and placed yourself at my disposal in order for me to form my luminous army. How few, children, how few. From my new Tepeyac, yes, new, for from here will flow the great river of grace to reconquer all of the children of God. From this little piece of land, hidden, rough, I call out to you once more. Children, there is no time left. The battle, our counterattack, begins. It begins with these words, which we give to you as light, protection, guidance, and consolation. Our words. Do not ignore them. Now Jesus continues. Follow me in this tremendous hour, as on that Friday in which all the powers of the devil united to torment me and put me to death. They now come together once more to torment and put my church, my mystical body, to death, and thus give death to all that belongs to God. Satan has never ceased longing to be adored, and what you see now is his plan to supplant God in everything. I let him show his plan, uncover his servants and his machinations, so that you can see them, so that you can realize who he is and where he has infiltrated himself. Children, he has infiltrated everything, and he thinks that he will have dominion over all. And I must let him continue to believe this while I gather my army to destroy his works at the appointed hour. This is the hour, children. I call you to my army. I speak to you, and I will speak to you. Do not reject my voice. My voice will thunder and will resound and will destroy every work of Satan. Open your eyes and your ears to these words of mine. In that message that you read, the little part of the message, and please go to direct to lifesightnews.com for the full message, and also uh, your website, Father, what's that? Missionofdivinemercy.com and .org. Beautiful. In that message, you mentioned, or Our Lady mentioned, how the church is without a shepherd. Uh, those are very strong words. It certainly feels that way. Um, any indication or what's your sense of what that means? We're very concerned about the situation with Pope Francis and much of what's going on in the church. And I'm, there's some things I can't yet say today that, that we hope to be saying very soon. But we, I think we are very concerned about the situation. And I do think the Lord is going to be giving a lot of light on that situation. But that's something I need to wait a little bit to speak more about. You speak of messages received Tell us a little bit about that. How does that work? How do, uh, who receives the messages here? Um, and what is the kind of discernment process? A lot of people, it's a unique gift to receive messages from heaven. It's happened since 
before Christianity, in, when our Lord uh, spoke to Abraham and Isaac and so on. But you have this still going on in our day, and yet we don't get to the depths of it much. Can I give you a little bit of history? Please, uh, please do. This came from, because I think that'll introduce this, that I was, I, I was a priest of the Congregation of St. John, and I was serving, this was 30 years ago, I was serving in Monterrey, Mexico, a big city in Mexico, in a poor inner city neighborhood. And one day, out of the blue, two women who had asked for an appointment with me, two women that I didn't know, two middle-aged women, came to me, and uh, so we had this appointment, and they said that they were receiving interior locution, you know, and, and interior messages from the Lord, and that he had given them a letter for me. And my eyes got real big. I had never received a letter from the Lord. And so that they shared with me that letter. And in it, the Lord, the, the message from the Lord was said that he was wanting to begin a great mission of mercy for his church in the situa- in the world today. But that the big obstacle to him was the lack of faith of the pastors of the church to what he was trying to do. And um, so they gave me this message, and, and, the, and the message said that the Lord was asking me to become their spiritual director. And so now I had to make a decision. You know, was this from the Lord? Was he asking me to do this? Or was this from the devil? Or was this just two ladies who were doing this to trick me? Or they were just deluded? And so I didn't have much experience in that at all. And so I turned to my brother priest, seeking their help. But the thing I quickly realized, and I think this is kind of a general situation, is that most of us priests, and I think bishops too, are not very prepared to discern in this area. The, 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 the attitude of most of them, not all of them, but the attitude of most of them was just kind of an allergic reaction. I just stay away from this stuff. Like, like one priest, and it's a, he was a good priest, one of my brother priests, when I talked to him about this, he said, we don't need all that stuff. We have the Gospels. But for me, the striking thing is it's precisely when you go to the Gospels that you see that the, the heroes of the Gospel are those who respond with simple faith. The skeptical, the cynical people are not the heroes of the Gospel. They're the, oftentimes the, 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 the enemies of Jesus. And so I, I, for me, it's precisely when we go to Scripture, when we go to the Gospels, we see God speaking and God intervening and God acting. And so... I was looking for guidance. One person who was very helpful for me was my uncle, Father Edward O'Connor, who was a, a theologian and providentially one of the foremost experts in the world on these type of experiences. And so he was very helpful. And gradually over time, I gradually discerned that, that this was from the Lord. And that was 30 years ago. And over 30, so I've now had many years and many thousands of messages and getting to know these women very well. And that my experience has really confirmed that this really is from the Lord. You yourself, you say, received messages. Um, how does that work? Well, I mean, it, it, just for most people, because it's, it's foreign for the majority. What is that like? One of these women who was very close to our community passed away unexpectedly in 2011. And it was about a year later that I began experiencing a little bit some simple, <laughs> some simple messages. Um, and mine came very simply, kind of very discreetly. And it, like I had to be kind of in a prayerful attitude um, because it, they, they didn't seem too far away from what could have been my own thoughts. That is, it's kind of a subtle distinction for myself. I know it's different for other people. And I think the members of our community I was very kind of reluctant because since I'm the one in charge of the community, and my role has always been more the role of the pastor helping to discern rather than the one who's receiving this. So I would always say to the community, I'm, I can't guarantee that this was from the Lord or not, but this is what I think he was saying to me. And so we had to discern as a community. And so that was my experience, but I'm not, I'm not a, a big example of that. What in your thoughts are, are, is now the, the import of this for the world? Why is our Lord calling you and why specifically here uh, is this being spread from? So I was with the congregation of St. John and then I was discerning that maybe the Lord is calling me to something different. And I've been sensing that for some years, but then these messages seem to kind of confirm it. And um, my sister, Mother Magdalene, who was with the Dominicans at that point, she came down to make a sabbatical year with us because her community, like a lot of communities, had changed a lot after Vatican II. And so she was having questions about that. 
And because uh, I had shared these messages that I had received, uh, these two women, the messages that women had received, I shared that with my family. And so there were several of us down there. Also, another person who's now with our community, Sister Amapola, she and her family got to know our community down there, so they also got to know those messages. And so we sensed, after a while, we sensed that the Lord was wanting to do something, but I felt like my community, like a lot of communities, a lot of priests, was like the Lord said in that message. Unfortunately, they were good priests. These were good priests, but they couldn't accept this type of, of things. And so I felt like that I needed to be in a place where I could be free to respond with, to what the Lord is doing. And so we finally asked to, um, I asked to make a sabbatical and fast forward. So in 2001, we began this little mission, Divine Mercy. And all that we want the mission to be is a community which does what God wants. We didn't have any grand ideas about what the mission should be. We just wanted to be a, a, a community that would listen to God and do what He what He's asking us to do. And so, a, a little like a little mission of mercy for the world, uh, which would be a movement, an ecclesial movement in the Catholic Church with a little core of consecrated members and then lay members. And so the Lord led us to New Braunfels and here in the hill country, we're here between the hill country of Texas, between San Antonio and Austin, to this property, led us to, to acquire this property where, where we live and where we offer our silent retreats called An Encounter with Jesus. But we're also, he's called us to build a sanctuary, like a refuge or a sanctuary, where people can come now to experience God's peace. A lot of people tell us that just driving on the property, they sense God's presence in this peace. But we also feel that he's, like he said in that message, that he has very special plans for this mission, that he's going to manifest in some ways special graces here that are going to be open for a lot of people. And I don't know if I answered your question or not. No, no, that's great. About the uh, property here, about the mission, what else would you like to share? Um, well, anybody is, is welcome to, to come come visit us here. So when, when so. What happened to, to explain what we're doing here now at the property? So uh, seven years ago, Sister Amapola, um, one of our members, it was on the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe. It was during a community mass, our community mass, so it was just our little community. And she had been praying for a difficult intention. That, uh, and, and she was feeling kind of down and kind of depressed and concerned. And then in uh, Thanksgiving after Holy Communion, she heard our Blessed Mother saying, We'll speak more after Mass, just out of the blue. And she had never experienced anything like that. And, and so she was surprised. But then after Mass, she, our Blessed Mother told her to get something so she could write down. And she began hearing our Blessed Mother speaking to her. A beautiful message about the situation that she was praying for. So that was very helpful for her. But then uh, she thought that was it. And she, she showed me the message that night. And it seemed to me like a message from the Lord. Um, because now since by that time it had been over 20 years I've been working with these ladies and that was it, we thought. But then on, on um, New Year's Eve, we were having a holy hour. And during holy hour, she began receiving another message. from. And since that time, New Year, so that was New Year's Eve, right as we were beginning 2017, then she began receiving a whole bunch of messages, like sometimes several times a day. And then Brother Mikhail, another member of our community, began receiving messages. And soon those messages began speaking of the Lord wanting us to prepare on this property a special little, <laughs> he called it a little teokali, which is the word that Our Lady of Guadalupe used, a little sanctuary. And he said, he told us where he wanted us to build it, it was a, a, a little hillside on our property. And he wanted it to be called, that hillside to be called Tepeyac, which is the name of the hill on which Our Lady of Guadalupe appeared. And he said that so we've done that. We, it was just an act of faith. We just, and some generous donors have helped us prepare this hillside and build a little sanctuary up there. We, we were able to show it to you and uh, improve the roads there because he says later on there's going to be a lot of people coming because he says there's going to be many graces flowing from there. And so we're very anxious for him to do that. And so I think that's the real reason for this property is because the Lord wants to, uh, to me, the idea I have is kind of like building a landing strip or a landing pad for the Lord, you know, a place not so much physically, but a place where there's faith so that God can come and manifest. And he's told us he will. I don't know exactly when or how he said soon. One of the things you mentioned uh, in your intro there was you talked about uh, the warning 
Um, we've heard about the warning from, from different folks, you know, Padre Pio talked about it and, and, uh, what, what is the warning in your sense of things and, and how does it fit in, uh, to the messages we've received here? Yeah. You know, the, and like you say, there's been Padre Pio and Garabandal and different places, uh, Medjugorje had different places have spoken of the warning. And, you know, so I think that, um, there's been a, a lot written about that and, I, I don't know if he's given us too much about that because he's he's already talked about that in a lot of places. But he he has spoken to us of an illumination of conscience that he would give an illumination of conscience to everybody. That is a moment in which everybody, because there's so much confusion right now, it's hard for people to know you know what's right and what's wrong, and so there would be a moment in which he, by his special grace, would clarify for everybody in their conscience to see themselves in the light of God. And, you know, there's already, I mean, uh, Brother Mikhail, who, uh, one of our members, has shared an experience that he had when he was a teenager. I, I don't think he minds me saying this. He was a young teenager, and he, was, uh, he was, wasn't living a good life and the drugs and so forth. And the Lord gave him one time a, a very strong experience of that he was on a road to hell, and um, which was, that was very helpful for him and, and, and so gradually, gradually, it took him still some time, but gradually turning his life around. But I think that that's what the Lord is promising, is a moment in which he will give us a divine light to understand ourselves, both to see, recognize our sinfulness, but also to recognize God's love, the, the particular love that God has for each one of us. I guess what's so unique now, though, is that you're getting or you're giving an illumination of the situation in the church, probably the situation that is the most confusing thing for Catholics of all times. But given that you're called to do that, that's not going to be easy for you because I'm sure you're going to get pushback even from your own bishop. Yes, this is, it's very difficult. It's a very difficult situation. And so we've waited a long time. The bishop had told us not to publish anything. And so we've been obedient all these years. But we feel right now uh, that we need to take this step. The Lord, when, when we, these two ladies came to me, the, in the letter that he gave me, he spoke of them as prophets. And that was kind of surprising to me because I thought of prophets as something that happened in the Old Testament with guys with beards and long, lo long robes, you know, patriarchs, and not these two nice women who were there with me. I began to realize that prophecy is not just something from a long time ago. St. Thomas Aquinas said that in every age, God gives to people the spirit of prophecy, not for new doctrine, but to, to guide our action. And so that's been a lot of our reflection is the role of prophets. And, you know, prophets are especially needed in times when the normal channels of God's guidance are not working. Like we saw it in Israel when there was corruption among the priests and the, and the kings, that God often had to send prophets to call the priest and the, and the rulers and the people back to his, his, his will. And I think that that's what's happening now. That God is giving this grace of prophecy because I think a lot of the normal channels in the church, which whose role is to clarify and guide according to God's will, have been destroyed confused, distorted, usurped. And so I think we that that we really need that grace of, of prophecy today. And you know, people think of prophecy first of all as um as speaking about the future and that that can be part of it, but that's not the essential. It's not always that St. Paul says that prophecy is given for our upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. And do we need upbuilding and encouragement and consolation today? So so prophecy, I think, has two key aspects. One, it's because we also speak today of prophecy often in the expanded sense that we say that all the baptized are share in the, in the prophetic grace of Jesus. And that's true through baptism. And that the ministers of the church share in a special way, participate in a special way in Jesus' prophetic mission. And that's true too. But when, when scripture speaks of prophecy, it's speaking of it in a more res restricted and stronger sense. It's speaking of uh, a revelation that comes directly from God. That is, it's not something that we get for the normal means of, you know, cate catechism and, you know, preachers and so forth, but it's something that comes directly from God. So that's the first element. And the second element is that it's not something a person is called just to keep for themselves. 
It's a um, something a person is called to share. And oftentimes the prophets didn't want to do that. Like Jonah, <laughs> Jonah got on a boat and tried to flee because it was so hard. And Jeremiah, he didn't want to share the message the Lord had given him because it was such a difficult, unpopular message. And so, you know, he said he was trying to keep these words inside of him, but it became like a fire that he had to let it out. And that's what we've said. So we've had this fire, which we haven't had permission to share. And so Jesus had, before he began his public life, he had these long years of his hidden life. And I feel like that that's what we've been living up till now, our hidden life, in which, like Jesus had this, the secret of his divine divinity he wasn't able to share for many years. And I feel like we have like a divine secret that God has given us, and we haven't been able to share it yet. Jesus has had us in this kind of desert, like John the Baptist in the desert, like or the hidden life. But now I feel like that God is calling us to begin our public life, a beginning to share these prophetic messages because the, the time has come and the Lord is asking us to do this now, uh, to share these messages for the world. It's interesting because you, you mentioned that our Lord wants to act that, 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 uh, you know, we realize and you're getting confirmation from the Lord that the solution to the problems of the world today and even the problems in the church, there's no more human solution. There's no more, we'll get it right. We're smart enough. Um, and everybody's waiting for that, but we don't know when that is. But what we do know is with the prophetic revelations that you're giving us now, that's providing clarity. And even that by itself is so needed, so wanted, because the confusion is so rampant. It's unbelievable. And that clarity that you've brought a little bit out now and you're going to do in the future, you say, that future, is it to wait more years? What are we talking about future-wise? In that message that, we, we, that we're sharing here, our Blessed Mother says, striking words, she says, the battle, the counterattack, begins with those words that she's saying. So if those words are truly from him, she's saying that by announcing those words, that's like the beginning mm-hmm. of this counterattack, what, what is called also the reconquest. And so that's, I think, gives us a sense of the strength of these words. So could I, could I tell you a little story? Please. <laughs> so uh, that, because it, it gets to that sense, what you're saying, that we feel that there's no human solution. So this happened to me uh, back in the 80s. I was in France with, and I was spending a year with a, co- a community of hermits up in the mountains, kind of part of the Alps. So beautiful mountains with four, four pine trees. But the springtime had been very dry. And so we were worried about forest fires. That was a big danger there. And one, one day, one of the brothers saw, um, the sisters lived about a mile down the road, and the brothers saw smoke coming on the hills, the, the mountain above their, 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 their uh, place. And so they sent me to tell the forest ranger. And he called into the fire service. And, um, and, but the fire service was, it was a pretty remote place, so it was going to take them about two hours to get there. And so the forest ranger invited me to jump in his Jeep, and we sped up to where the fire was. And we got to this fire, and it was about maybe a half an acre. And, but the trees were so dry that these pine trees were just going up like torches. And it was kind of windy. And so the, uh, we asked the, the forest ranger, well, he, he, so he, he, he cut two pine branches, and he said, well, use these to bat the fire, to try to bat the fire. Well, that might not sound very uh, efficient. Well, it wasn't very effective, in fact. And so the fire kept growing and growing. And about 15 or 20 minutes later, I'm getting tired. And the fire is now, it's growing and growing. It's about two acres. And I think it's going to be too late. By the time the fire service is going to get here, it's going to be out of control. It's going to destroy the sister's area. And then I thought, you know, I'm a monk. I should be praying about this <laughs> because I'd been so such an adrenaline rush that I hadn't thought to pray. And so, so I just started praying. But it wasn't any exalted prayer. It was just kind of a desperate, uh, as I kept on fighting, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee, our Father. And then within a couple of minutes, something happened which was pretty subtle that normally I wouldn't have even noticed it. But I noticed it this time because it made such a difference. The wind had been blowing in one direction, and then suddenly the wind changed and began blow, changed almost 180 degrees. Mm-hmm. And so now it was blowing back, uh, blowing back in the opposite direction. So the, the fire line was now being blown back where it had already burned. And that changed everything. 
And so it just began to peter out by itself. And by the time the fire service got there, it was very easy to put out just the last remaining things. And so that happened. I thought, well, that's funny. And I just forgot about it. Mm-hmm. And then a couple of years ago, I realized, oh, that, that was like a parable that the Lord had just given me, a real-life parable, to understand three things that, that gets to your point. For me, the fire represents all the evil that we're dealing with, whether it's in our personal lives, whether it's on our families, whether it's on our economy, whether it's health, whether it's world situations, whether it's in the church, all the different ways that the, the fire of Satan is destroying things. And just like in that situation, it was a situation that we didn't have the means to solve. And so we're dealing with a lot of situations today that we and sometimes all humanity together cannot solve. Man cannot solve. And so that's the first thing to recognize. And that's very important. And that's a step that I think almost anybody, even not just people of faith, but even people of no faith can realize that we're facing very grave situations. And we kind of like the first step of the 12-step program, realize I'm facing a, this, a, a battle that I can't win by myself. And just like in that in that the twelve step, that the second step is to turn to the Lord. In this case, th- who controls the wind? Of course, it was God, and so it was God intervening, really intervening. It was God Himself. I mean, He didn't. <laughs> I mean, it was it was a little bit subtle, well, the way God often is. But for me, it was very clear that it was God intervening. And so that's the second key point: that we don't have the solution, but God does. And God wants, God doesn't want to be a God who's far away and distant. He wants to be a God who's acting and intervening in our world. That's what all scripture shows, right? From, from Genesis to Revelation, it shows a God who is acting and intervening in the life of his people, speaking to his children. You know, he's not a God who says, I'll come back in 2000 years and I'll see you later. He's a God who is actively present in his, in, for his people. But if that's the case, why are things so bad? If God is the solution, and if God can help, and if God wants to help, why is the situation still so bad? What's lacking? There's a third element. And so for in the case of this fire, he could have changed the wind whenever he wanted, but he didn't do it until there was this miserable, pathetic little prayer, which wasn't a great prayer, but, he, but it seemed like he wanted at least that little act of faith to act, to intervene. And, and that's the, the key, the, 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 the key for him to act. We see it all the time in the gospel that he wants to act, but he needs our faith. You know, like the, in, in, um, in, um, Nazareth, the gospel says that he couldn't work many miracles there because of their lack of faith. And I think that's the situation often in the church, that, that there's a lack of faith. And so what, what he's called our community to is faith. And so the, the charism he's given to our community is faith so that God can act. Not just faith so that we can act. I mean, that's good if by our faith that that inspires us to do stuff. That's good. But that's not enough. What we need is God himself to act. And that's, that, that's what, so that's what our little mission is about, is about the faith that's necessary that permits God himself to act. And I think, and our community has had a difficult, you know, the Lord's been giving us, so these messages, I said, began 30 years ago with these women. And, and I think the messages he's given to our community are like a continuation uh, of that. So it's kind of began 30 years ago, and then for our community, seven, these seven years, it's been very difficult. There's been, a, you know, the, the, the church authorities, are, most of them are not, not interested in this at all. And not are not interested, but don't want to have, don't want it to be published. And there's been a lot of trials. All our community members know it's been a, like a desert for us. So we're still very small. We've had to make the Lord's tried our faith very much. But but that but doesn't that make sense? If he if he wants a community that's going to be a community of faith, that he's going to have to put our faith to the trial. Kind of like Abraham, yeah, having to go all these years. The promise is given, and then Abraham goes all these years without seeing any results until 25 years later. And, and you brought up the example in our conversation of Noah. Noah is a great example. The Lord tells him this crazy thing of building an ark, and that takes a long, many, many years, maybe a hundred years to build. And everybody's thinking, Noah, you're crazy. There's no, even when you get it built, what are you going to do with it? There's no water here. And, and that's kind of what we've been doing, kind of building this little ark, this little refuge, because so those, I think, are the three key points of the messages. The messages are speaking about 
being realistic about how bad the situation is, but also the hope that God himself wants to intervene. And what he needs from us is our faith and our trust. And so you know, that's why, like the mission, the, the, the um, image of divine mercy. So in these critical times that we're living, we need real, simple, clear instructions, not complicated things. And so Jesus, the, the image of divine mercy, he shows the rays which are coming from him. God's mercy being poured out on our world. But then he tells us what we're supposed to do. He puts that little inscription on the bottom, very simple and very short. Jesus, I trust in you. An act of trust or faith in God. That's what he, that's what he needs from us. It's a, it's a very beautiful message because it's one we need to hear in that the confusion is such that it's got everybody who's paying attention at a loss. And yes, we have some faith in Jesus. Yeah, Jesus is going to take care of it. But you say to yourself, in the meantime, what am I going to do? I've got a family. I, what are we supposed to do right now? How am I supposed to raise my kids Catholic when it's all over the place? And as they go out, you know, your kids get older and they're out in the world and then they hear from whomever, whatever, and then they don't know what to think themselves. So dire situation, but that trust in the Lord uh, is, uh, is a beautiful message and knowing that he's going to act. And uh, the clarity is one that uh, we truly need. Your final thoughts, Father. Well, just so um, I think that, uh, stay tuned. I think the Lord's going to be giving us a lot more messages here. And, and as there's also other great messages in many places in the world, and I would really, yeah, I think one very practical thing that people could do you know, would, would be to be a little bit more open to prophetic graces. You know, St. Paul says, do not extinguish the Holy Spirit. That's kind of an unusual thing, isn't it, to say do not extinguish the Holy Spirit. Of course, we can't extinguish the Holy Spirit himself, but we can extinguish things that he's doing. Like he can be giving us an inspiration, and we can shut that inspiration down. Or he can be giving someone else an inspiration who comes to us, and we can pour cold water on that inspiration. So he says, do not extinguish the Holy Spirit. And how important is that? If the Holy Spirit is wanting to help, we need to be open, right, to all the, the, to what the Holy Spirit is. Of course, we need to discern. It needs prudence. But people often reject things because they say we have to be prudent. We, we, you know, and we do have to be prudent. But prudence also means being careful that we don't say no to something that might be from the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be, so St. Paul says, do not extinguish the Holy Spirit. Do you know what the next thing he says is? It's kind of surprising. Do not despise prophesy, prophecy. Because mm -hmm. that's what's happening in our church. Many, unfortunately, many pastors, many of the leaders of the church are despising prophecy. And that's a, it's the same Paul, that's 1 Thessalonians 5. And then he says, but then the, there's another problem with some people who receive any prophecy, and there's also false prophets. Jesus warns us about false prophets. The fact that he warns us about false prophets also means that there's going to be true prophets, right? Because otherwise he wouldn't warn us about false prophets. But we do have to be careful. And so he says, um, do not, he says, do not despise, do not extinguish the Holy Spirit, do not despise prophecy, but test everything. And keep what is good. So he means don't accept anything that just says because it's prophet. Things need to be discerned. They need to be seen, discerned prudently. But discerning prudently is different from despising prophecy. And so I think that that's something that people could take away from this. First of all, to be open to the ways that God is speaking today. Because God is speaking today to his church. God has not abandoned his church. But the problem is that it's often been a lack of faith on our part, which have not permitted him to act as he wants to. So, so my final words would be our, our charism, faith so that God himself can act. Jesus, we trust in you. Amen to that. Father Jesus, Mary, so good. Uh, excuse me, let me do that again. <laughs> Amen to that. Father John, Mary, so good to be with you. God bless you. And let me conclude by telling you that in the next two Wednesdays, that's on March 6th and March 13th, the other messages will be revealed live at LifeSite News at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday, March 6th, and Wednesday, March 13th. So please go to our uh, main page, LifeSiteNews.com, and it will be right there airing live for you Wednesday, March 6th, and Wednesday, March 13th at 11 a.m. Eastern. We'll see you there, and God bless you. <laughs>